y'all. Good morning. How are you feeling? Good. Almost the weekend. We're getting there. Close, almost. All right, question. You all are here in Lynchburg. You're in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Who here has been on the Appalachian Trail? Raise your hand. Awesome. Who here has spent a night in the woods? OK. Everyone with your hand up, you are ahead of where I was in high school or college. So just know that starting out. I did not grow up as a hiker, backpacker, camper, runner, any of it. I actually went to a college prep school, a lot like you all, in North Carolina, and I was a boarder there. And I felt a lot of pressure in high school because I don't know the juniors, seniors in here. What's the number one question every adult asks you right now? Bingo, right. And one day I will let you know that you'll make a decision about this and the pressure will be off for a few years and that's good news. But then towards the end of college, once again, you're going to start to feel that weight and now everyone's going to come and they're going to ask you what? What are you going to do with your life? <laughs> so when I was 21 years old, I was about to graduate from college and I felt all this pressure to have my life figured out. And I didn't know where I was supposed to go or what I was supposed to do or who I really was. And at that point, honestly, I just wanted time and space to try to figure things out. So growing up, kind of kind of like y'all here, I was close to the Appalachian Trail. I had heard of it. I was in North Carolina. I had never been on it, but I knew enough to know that it was super long. Anyone tell me how long it is? 2,000, yes, that's if you get 2,000, you're good. 2,190 miles long. Stretches through 14 states between Georgia and Maine. And if you want to hike the entire thing all at once, how long would that take? Six months. Six months is average. Right now, we're not going fast. We're not thinking about an, a record. So if you want to hike the whole thing, the average amount of time is eight six years. months or eight years. So I decided I was going to go out and try the Appalachian Trail because it sounded affordable and it seemed like an adventure. And in my 21-year-old brain, hiking was technically just walking. So how hard could it be? So I got my brother's old Boy Scout gear and then set off on my own from Georgia with the goal of walking all the way to Maine. And right away, it just kicked my butt. It, it kind of broke me, and I think I, I sort of needed that in a way. But the thing about backpacking that's so hard, and I will say I think harder than trail running, is backpacking is relentless. I played sports in high school. I played sports in college. But everything I had done up until that point lasted a few hours. Or maybe it was a weekend tournament. But the results were the same. You got to take a shower. <laughs> You got to eat a warm meal. You could sleep in a soft bed. Usually someone is there cheering you on. And when you are backpacking, you're walking up and down mountains all day, every day, with everything you need in a pack on your back. So aching shoulders, blisters on your feet, sleeping on the hard ground. You're out there in all types of weather. In fact, one of my first <laughs> lessons on the trail is you never appreciate how much it rains until you live outside. Now, right now, I know where you are, where I am. We're kind of in a drought. It hasn't rained enough. But when I started the Appalachian Trail, it rained 12 of my first 14 days. It did. And I felt it. I felt it. But I'll never forget the sense of pride I had when I finally made it out of Georgia. That's 77 miles. And I got into North Carolina, and I hit the boundary for the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Has anyone been there? A few people? Yeah, it's actually cool. I had never visited, but I found out kind of hiking towards the park that it is one of the most visited national parks in the country. The Smokies and Golden Gate Recreation Area in California go back and forth as the most visited national park. So it gets more guests than the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or Yellowstone. And I was like, OK, if all these people are coming to the Smokies, there must be something awesome to see here. So if you were going for a hike, what would you want? What would your hopes be? Food. Views, food, sure. Survival. Survival. <laughs> yes, that. I wanted the views. I wanted, it was mid-April, so I was kind of hoping for what comes out in the spring, wildflowers, right? And then do you want to see animals or not? Yeah, I wanted to see wildlife like at a safe distance. Bears. 
here, sure, over there, where I could like take a photo and get credit but not feel scared. That's what I wanted. But instead, I spent three days hiking through the park. I never had a single view. It was foggy, misty, rainy. Turns out there is a reason. They call them the Smokies. Sometimes the clouds stick on top of those mountains. The only animals I saw were birds and squirrels, and mid-April was still too early up at 6,000 feet to see any wildflowers. So this had not met my expectations. And my last night in the park, the last thing I wanted to do was try to set up my tent with my cold, numb fingers. Now on the Appalachian Trail, maybe some of you have seen them, maybe not, but they do have these very rustic, three-sided wooden buildings, wooden shelters, where you can spend the night. So I pulled up to one of these shelters and rolled out my foam pad, got into my sleeping bag, and I remember falling asleep that night listening to sound of rain on the roof. The next morning I woke up and my first thought was like, oh, I don't hear the rain, yes. It must have stopped. And then I sat up and I looked outside and what do you think I saw? Snow. snow. Yeah. Mid-April, there's about a foot of snow on the ground. And it is coming down in blizzard-like conditions and I am 18 miles from the nearest access point. So I start to feel very panicked. I don't have what I need to get stuck inside the Smokies in a blizzard. I'm low on food. Someone mentioned food. I was supposed to hike out that day, and when you're cold and wet, you just tend to eat more, and so I was very low on provisions. All I had left was half a jar of peanut butter and one package of Pop-Tarts. Cinnamon and sugar, so the good kind, but still, like, not enough, right? And I'm wearing all my warm clothes, and I'm freezing, and I'm just thinking, I have got to get out of here. So I'm determined to hike out of the park, and I'm putting on all my gear and my clothes, and I look down where I put my shoes the night before. The laces are covered in ice, but somehow I stomp them on, throw on my pack, and then I start hiking. And one thing I love about the Appalachian Trail compared to other US trails, international trails, is that relatively, it is very well marked. That's a good thing. I like a well marked trail. The only problem is, it's very well marked the entire way with one symbol, one marker. A bunch of you raised your hand saying you've been out there. What is that marker? Do you remember? White a white rectangle. Right. Which is usually so easy to see until what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, until you're in a blizzard, right? So most of the time you can see the trail on the forest floor. That's not happening. And now I am looking for these two by six inch white rectangles, we call them white blazes, that they paint on trees, they paint on rocks to let you know you're headed in the right direction, but everything's covered in snow. So I'm trying to use my resources, my map, my guidebooks to at least go in the right direction. And most of the time I was in the forest and that was good because the trees kind of protect you from the wind and the sleet and the snow. Then at one point I had to leave the forest and cross this exposed ridge line. So no protection. So I step out of tree cover and I feel the wind and the snow and the sleet and it's hitting my face and it hurts, it burns. And so naturally I just kind of duck my head and close my left eye and keep going as quickly as I can to get back inside the forest and I make it there and I lift my chin and something is wrong. I couldn't open my eye. It had frozen shut. Did you all know that could happen? No. no, no, neither did I. And so I throw off my glove and I have to stand there and pick icicles off of my eyelashes and wipe frozen crust from the corners of my eye until I can once again lift my eyelid and regain my sight. But even then, I'm just telling you, here I am in the middle of a blizzard by myself in a national park, not sure if I'm on the trail or lost. I'm exhausted, I'm stressed, I'm scared, I'm overwhelmed, and truthfully, all I wanna do in this moment is cry. And then I think to myself pretty quickly, I probably shouldn't cry. Why is that? Right, I, I just had an eye frozen shut. I don't need two, right? And so I'm like, okay, hold it in. And what I do is I take a deep breath and I drink some water, have a bite of Pop-Tart. And then I pull out my maps, I pull out my guidebooks. I try to figure out where I am and where I need to go. And after looking around, I finally see a corner of a blaze sticking out and I head in that direction. And after a very long day with several wrong turns, I finally made it to the park boundary and a road. There was a hiker hostel and I was safe. 
But getting lost in the Smokies in the blizzard, for me, this happened almost 20 years ago, and I will never forget it because I'm telling you, there are many, many times in my life I've felt scared and stressed and lost and overwhelmed. And it's interesting because before I started hiking, I thought, okay, the number one biggest mistake you can make if you go out and you're hiking is what? Don't get lost, right? Yeah, I was terrified to get lost. I can tell you I have been lost dozens of times. And somewhere along the way, I accepted that getting lost is not a mistake. Getting lost is a natural part of any long journey. If you do something long enough, at some point you take a wrong turn. It happens. But the mistakes are made when you hear about people getting lost and people having to go and rescue them or, or help find them. It's often because once you are lost, you might make a bad decision. And there are plenty of times in my hiking career, if I got lost, I would panic and I would rush to where I thought the trail would be. And at times it led me into a ravine. One time I was in a cactus patch. It never went well. So what I started doing on the trail, I did it naturally this first time, but now it's just habit. If I feel lost, if I feel that way, I take a breath. I drink water, I eat food, because I don't care if you're a hiker, or if you're a mid-career professional, or a high schooler, or my seven-year-old son, you make better choices when food and water are in your system. And then I ask myself, what are my resources? So on my you know, hike, it's typically map, guidebook, compass, whatever I have, GPS now, cell phone, it's changed. But whatever my resources are, I identify them and I use them. Off-trail, same thing. Okay, I'm not physically lost, but I'm not in a good place right now, so what are my resources? Who can I talk to? What can I do? What can I identify that makes me feel better and helps me get back to where I want to be? That's my routine. Getting lost happens. You will feel lost. But if you develop a routine and a habit, it can lead you back where you want to go. So that was one lesson from the Smokies. The other one is that like, I think in American culture, I just grew up thinking hard work was the most important thing. And hard work is great, but vision and direction have to come first. You got to know where you're going if you want your hard work to matter. There were times in the Smokies I'd give 100% energy and effort. And if I wasn't on trail, it would take me farther away from where I wanted to go. It's really interesting to me that I hiked the Appalachian Trail after college because a lot of like, my most valuable education happened in the woods. And after about a month and a half of hiking, I made it up to Virginia. Now I'm out of the snow, I'm out of the cold. Finally, there's wildflowers, and I love Virginia. A lot of hikers kind of, uh, they struggle with Virginia because it's just so much of the trail is in this state. Over 500 miles of the Appalachian Trail is in Virginia. So they feel a little stuck here. But I got to Virginia, and I thought it was beautiful. And now that I was out of the cold and I was getting used to the backpacking, one thing for me is I started to really enjoy just the community on the trail, because every day you're meeting new people. And that's one of the best parts of the experience. I mean, there's folks out there, all different ages, backgrounds, beliefs. Do you want to guess the youngest person ever to hike the entire trail? Yeah, it's kind of how you define it now, hiked the trail. There have been five-year-olds, there have been four-year-olds, there was a baby who actually, this family is from Virginia, not far from here, but the parents carried their baby the entire way. So if that counts, I mean, end to end, it's like a one-year-old did the entire trail. On the other end of that, there have been 80-year-olds to hike the entire thing, but it is it is a privilege to get to take five to six months and go into the woods. And it's hard to do that. It's hard to leave behind life and family and responsibilities and bills in order to do that. And because of that, there are two main age groups, two main demographics that you see trying to do the entire footpath. They usually fall into one of two groups. I was one of them. What age was I? Yeah, out of school, 21. What's the other age you see trying to do? Retired, Retired right. So you get a lot of 20s and a lot of 60s, and it's awesome. Because there's this total exchange of energy and wisdom, and on the trail, conversation is your entertainment, so you get to know people really well really quickly. And I spent a lot of time with folks in their 60s, in their 70s, who shared a lot about their lives 
and what they would do differently and what they were most proud of and what they regretted. And once again, I was like, man, that's an education. Why didn't I get that in college? So I was really grateful for that. But up in Virginia, there was this one time where I met another hiker, a young guy around my age, and we walked and talked and had this really interesting conversation. And then at the end of the day, I was you know, ready to head off on my own once again. So on the trail, when you're ready to create space, usually you just say something like, hey, it's been really great hiking together. I'll see you down the trail. So I said that, and nothing happened. He stayed right behind me, and it started to become clear, hey, I think this guy really wants to hike together. But he was a nice enough guy, and I, you know, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I also didn't necessarily want to hike together. So I decided I just needed to give him like, more hints, more clues about how I felt. So I remember I turned to this guy, and I said, gosh, you know what? I really like hiking by myself. <laughs> and he turned to me and he goes, yeah, me too. And he kept following me. So a little while later, I tried again. And this time, I said, um, I said, gee, I am so glad that I don't have a hiking partner. And he turned to me, and what do you think he said? Me too. me too. And he kept following me, and he kept following me for six days. I know. And this is, unfortunately, because of the world we live in, this is where I have to stop and clarify. I never felt threatened. I mean, physically, I am pretty sure I could have taken this guy. But, <laughs> but emotionally, it was uncomfortable, it was parasitic, and clearly I was fed up and I was frustrated because after nearly a week of this, there was this brief break where I didn't see him right behind me on the trail, and I thought to myself, this is it, this is my chance, I've got to escape. So what are you gonna do if you're trying to escape from someone on the Appalachia Trail? Run and? Yes, this is what came into my brain. And so in that moment, I run off trail, get on all fours, I army crawl underneath a rhododendron tree with my pack still on. And now a rhododendron tree is just a big shrub. So now I'm belly down in the dirt under a shrub, looking up at the trail and praying that this guy is gonna pass without seeing me. When all of a sudden I realize this is the most pathetic I have ever felt in my entire life. Like I'm in the dirt under a shrub trying to avoid this guy. And why? Because here's the thing. Deep down, I knew that if at any point I had turned to him and said, I don't want to hike with you anymore, he would have left me alone. But when I was 21, I didn't have the courage, I didn't have the communication skills, and I had grown up in this wonderful Southern culture, which I love, I love the Southeast, but I think especially as a woman, it had just been ingrained in me that the most important thing was what? To be nice. Yep. And now I'm underneath a shrub in the dirt asking myself, is this nice? This doesn't feel nice. How did I get here? And the thing is, all I knew in this moment is that is not how I wanted to live my life. I didn't want to hide, right? I knew it when I did it. I was like, this does not feel good. I don't want to hide from other people. I don't want to hide from hard conversations. I don't want to hide from how I really feel. And this is not my story. So it's not how I go down. So I built up my courage. And then, OK, if you think it's awkward to army crawl frontwards underneath the rhododendron tree, it's much worse going backwards, right? So now like, my pack's getting stuck. I'm crawling out. But I make my way up like leaves in my hair. And I get to the trail just as this guy comes around the turn. And then we have a really hard, awkward conversation. But by the end of it, I'm hiking by myself, and I have the space I needed. It's so interesting to me, again, like just this contrast. And I love my formal education. I'm back in university right now for a grad school program. But it's crazy to me that I took communication classes in college, and I never learned how to use my voice until I hiked the trail. And now, because you know, a part of this was not wanting to be mean. We talked about this. I grew up with this value of being nice, of being kind. 
But what happened is that shifted. I have no desire to be mean. But if I'm kind and if I'm nice, then I'm going to be honest and I'm going to be upfront with you from the beginning. And I'm also going to be kind enough to myself to not put myself in those situations anymore. It just shifted, right? And that's what the Appalachian Trail does. If you spend five months outdoors, you shift, you change, you transform. I got to the end five months later, I was a different person. I mean, I valued quality relationships with people who were completely different from me. I valued simplicity. I learned I could be content with just the items I carried in a pack on my back. It sounds so minimal. It sounds so Spartan. But here's the thing. When you realize you can be content with very little, it's liberating. You have so many more choices. Also, like some of my greatest fears when I started out ended up being some of the best parts of the experience. It's interesting, you know, I, I started out, what would you be scared of if you were hiking the Appalachian Trail? Bears. bears and snakes. It's like the number one thing people say, bears and snakes. I actually didn't see a bear my whole first hike, which is kind of crazy, but I did love seeing wildlife in its natural habitat. And by the way, the animals I've had the most trouble with on trail in all my experiences and owning a guiding service for over 15 years, the animals we have the most trouble with on trail unfriendly dogs off leash, and insects. And we have those in our neighborhoods, so not a reason to not go hiking. Uh, I was scared of being cold and wet, I will tell you that. I don't like being cold and wet, but I learned I can move through it. But I think another big fear I had starting out was I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna be bored and lonely. I never felt lonely which was surprising to me. I think the quality of conversation and connection when you had it was so good that even if I was by myself, I didn't feel lonely. And I also think there's something to being in a living environment. You know, when we're in these sterile four walls, or, or honestly, if I'm in a group of people where I don't feel like I have connections, that makes me feel lonely. But in the woods, I never felt that way. But I did feel bored. I did. I mean, you're just walking for like five months, right? It's kind of repetitive. And I wasn't good at it because we are not taught how to be bored. There is always something for you to do. There is always a to-do list. There is always a commitment. We are constantly multitasking and there's always like a, a noise, a sound. There's just stimulus all the time going out and around us. And so I got to the trail and it was, it was pretty quiet and I could be pretty single-minded. And that felt really weird. And in the beginning, when I was bored, I was like, oh my gosh, please, a bird, a squirrel, something happen. But then I started to get used to being bored. And then I started thinking my thoughts through to completion without interruptions. Or I wouldn't think at all. And not that I'm like empty minded, but my mind was at rest. And for the first time in my life, I didn't feel like I constantly had to react or respond or produce. I think it really was the first time I could just be. And once I got comfortable with the boredom or worked through it or however you want to put it, there was peace. And it was a type of peace I had never experienced before and I was so grateful to have found. So all those changes took <laughs> took weeks and miles and sweat and tears. It's not, if you go and walk out 50 yards on a trail and this all doesn't happen at once, that's normal. It's not supposed to. But there was one change for me that happened almost in a moment. And it wasn't too far away from here. I was on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. There's a mountain called Roan Mountain. And most of the Appalachian Trail is in the forest. Right, which is great. I love the biodiversity, I love the trees, but it's nice to have a view. And this is one of those few places where you get up and you have this just incredible 360 degree view of undeveloped mountains. And I got there at sunset and just happened to have it to myself. And the sky was changing colors and the mountains were changing colors and you could feel the breeze and you could hear the birds and it just, honestly was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And then all of a sudden it hit me that I was a part of it. At least that's how I felt. And at first I'm like, mm, uh, uh, am I a part of this? Am I a part of nature? 
And I think my like background and my upbringing was like, no, 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 no. Like nature's cool and nature's beautiful, but nature is out the window. But now I had been in it and moving through it for almost a month and I was surrounded by mountains and it, it felt like I was a part of it. And so I asked myself a question and, and this is a big question. I don't think it's a right or wrong answer type of question, but I just started in my head to ask like biologically, scientifically, am I a part of nature? What do you think when you ask it that way, biologically, like, are we a part of nature? You could say yes, you could say no, you could argue it either way, but in my mind I was like, yeah, that checks out. So the next thing was like, okay, well, spiritually, like does this check off my spiritual lens? Am I a part of all this? And I thought that I was. So for the first time in my life, I accepted, or I believed, that I was a part of nature. And when that happened, it felt like a warm wave crashed over me. And the first thing I felt was I felt beautiful. And I am not talking about a cultural billboard magazine commercial beautiful. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you I was looking out at the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my entire life, and I felt like I was a part of it. And that made me feel beautiful in a way I wish I could have felt at 16. On top of that, I felt wild. Wild, like, like wild. <laughs> and it's fun. We don't feel wild enough. We feel put in boxes so often in our life and we are on a set path and it feels so hard for us to pivot or to create or to do something unexpected. But when you feel wild, you feel like you can do that. And the third part of this is I looked all around and realized that if I was a part of it, I was responsible for it. And that my actions had impacts and they mattered. And also what happened to my environment, it affected me. What happens to my neighbor matters to me. So seeing this world as interconnected and realizing my place in it has changed the way I have lived my life. And it's influenced everything I've done since then. And once I got off the trail, the first thing I did, well, I took a shower, ate some food, but got a job in Virginia because I loved hiking through here and I needed to make some money. But as soon as I saved up enough time, enough money, what do you think I wanted to do next? Hike. Yeah, rest, take a nap. Eventually, yes. But there are trails everywhere. They are very affordable. They're a great way to travel. They're a great way to learn and they're an awesome way to see the world. So I actually wanna take a minute and share with y'all some of my favorite photos from different hiking trails all around the world. That's my cue. You like that? Here we go. I'll try to tell you where they were taken. Uh, we'll start the journey in Africa at Mount Kilimanjaro. This is in Australia, and uh, that's a five-foot lizard on that tree. <laughs> this is in South America. That hurt? Yep. This is the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. Uh, 
And this is the Pacific Crest Trail. All the rest of the pictures are from Europe. Okay, hopefully you all enjoyed those photos. Maybe they want to make you want to go take a hike. I do want to say I like sharing photos from all over the world because it's different than what we naturally see and experience here. But having hiked in six different continents, I also want to tell you my favorite trail in the entire world, my favorite place to hike are the Appalachian Mountains. And sometimes I think that when they're in our backyard, we don't appreciate them, but we should. And I've hiked the Appalachian Trail three times. So we got to do it two more times, but I set records so it gets quicker, so don't worry. The second time I did it, my life looked different. I had started my own business, I had gotten married, I didn't have five to six months, but I could carve out time in the summer. And also my husband just happened to be a school teacher, so what does that mean? Lots of money. No, <laughs> summer's off, summer's off, it did. So anyways, we could make this work, we could maybe put together about six weeks, maybe two months, where we could go out and do the trail. And he didn't want to do it with me. That was, that was part of it. He's like, this is your thing. But he was willing to support me, meet me at road crossings. He did some sightseeing along the way. So I was doing a supported hike. And as long as I was doing a supported hike in a shorter amount of time, I figured, hey, ever since I started hiking backpacking, I heard about these guys, these crazy guys, who go out and set records on these long distance trails. But ever since I had heard about the records, every single one I knew of on the Appalachian Trail had been set by a man. Truthfully, there really wasn't a woman's record. And I thought, okay, we're going quickly. I've got support. So if I get to the end and I don't break my ankle along the way, then maybe we can establish a woman's record. So I went out the second time with my husband's help and we hiked from one end all the way to the other in 57 days. I climbed up the last mountain. I touched the rock at the end. Together, we had established a women's record. I had averaged 38 miles a day. Also, I looked at my husband with all the love and gratitude in my heart, and he looked at me, and he goes, we are never doing that again, right? It's not a fun way to spend his summer vacation as a teacher, but we had done it. We were successful. The only problem was we walked down the mountain to go home, and something felt off. Something felt wrong. What do you think it was? I don't know what, I couldn't hear it, but. You broke your leg. I didn't break my leg. No, that, was, that wasn't it at all. I felt too good. Oh. I felt great. Felt too good to have just set a record. I still had energy left. I could have kept going. And by the end, I had realized that from the beginning, I had limited myself. Because when I started this thing, here's what I did. I knew about a men's record, so naturally I just created a separate box. So there's a men's record, there should be a women's record. And then I told myself, okay, I grew up playing sports, I had two older brothers, guys are typically faster and stronger, so the men's record at the time was 47 days. Really good, 47 days. I said, if the men's record is 47 days, I did some type of math equation in my head, I don't know how it went, it just went beep, bop, boop, bop. 
And I got to the other side and I was like, a really good women's record will be 10 days behind the men. So men was 47 days. Do you remember when I finished? 57. Because the entire time I did exactly what my mind told my body I should do. And I never gave my body to show me the chance to show me what it was capable of. And I'm someone, if you can't tell already, like I am feisty, I am competitive, I hate when other people try to put me into a box or tell me what I can and cannot do. I hate it. It's worse when you do it to yourself. And when I got to the end, I knew that I had. And I knew that I had something left. Did but I did. Okay, that's where we get to, right? I went home, I worked three years, I thought it would go away, maybe I could get over it. Did that happen? No, it got bigger, it got stronger. I eventually asked my husband if he would help me one more time. I will never forget his response because he looked at me and he goes, if you are asking, do I want to help you? The answer is no, this is not how I like to spend a summer vacation. But he said, if this is really that important to you, then you know I'm going to be behind you. And it was, it was important to me. And so I committed and I trained and I told people that I was going for the overall record. And let me tell you, when I, when I told people I was going out to set the women's record, they were like, oh, good job, that's great. Girl power, yes. And then I said I was going after the overall record and people were like, are, are you sure? Like, I, but you can't do that. Like, you can't, the, like the men's record, a, it was 10 days ahead of where you finished, and also B, these guys, these guys who set the record, they are elite trail runners. They are men who go out and they don't just finish 100 mile races, they win 100 mile races consistently. They're the men with the barely there shorts on the cover of running magazines. Like, you're a woman, you're a hiker, you've never won a 5K. Like, what business do you have competing with these guys? But one of the things that this process made me realize is just A, like how much negativity, how many voices we hear on an everyday basis. Like there's just so much noise in our world. Noise, noise, noise. And the gift of this process was training. Because I would go out into the woods, and when you go out into the woods, all that negativity, all the noise, the news, the voices, they go away. And if I went far enough, I would start to hear my own voice. And the two words that kept coming to me while I was training and I was out there and I was putting in miles, the two words I heard over and over again were, I belong. I belong. And some days I believed it and some days it came to me and I would just say it because I needed to hear it. But here's the thing. I did not look like the guys. I did not have the same resume. I did not have the same background. But when I was out there, I was doing the exact same thing. My body was putting in the same miles. I was a part of nature, so I needed to tell myself that I belonged. And that's what I said when I started that summer. And this time, I didn't start in Georgia. I started in Maine, was working my way down south. But starting off in, in Maine and New Hampshire, they're the toughest two states. So challenging enough already, even if things go perfectly. But I started out, and I got shin splints on day three. So I can always tell who has had shin splints because it's the people who groan, like when I say the word, like, ah, like, I've had a lot of overuse injuries. Shin splints have been the worst. Uphill is excruciating. Downhill is almost unbearable. And then I got into New Hampshire, and it's the place where you have the most exposed trail above tree line. It's the one place on the trail you really, really, really want good weather. I had 24 hours of constant rain followed by a sleet storm, a sleet storm, the last week of June. And going through the sleet storm, I developed moderate hypothermia, and the only reason I was able to keep going is because my husband packed up all our gear and supplies and hiked in to find me, set up the tent, I could get into double sleeping bags, finally get warm, eat a ton of food, and then continue. And I told myself if I can just get to Vermont, It'll be OK. If I can just get to Vermont, things will get better. But then I hit Vermont, and the shin splints did not magically disappear. And now I had these strange side effects from the hypothermia. And because of that, or on top of that, I don't know, but I got really sick. 
And so instead of hiking down the trail, I'm now running off trail into the bushes every few minutes, becoming depleted and dehydrated and barely going a mile per hour. And I'm a day behind record pace. So I finally stumble out to the next row crossing and tears are like streaming down my face and my husband is there waiting for me. And I look at him and I go, we are done. Like not you and me, he knew that, right? But like we are done with the trail, we are done with this record and all I wanna do is go home. And he looked at me and he said, if you really wanna quit, that's fine. But he said, you just can't quit right now. Because right now you feel way too bad to make a good decision. So you got to eat and drink and take medicine and then just keep going until tomorrow night. And tomorrow night, if you want to quit, he said, I'll take you home. So he said that, he gave me a new day pack, and then he drove off. And it's very hard to quit without a ride, right? <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. And so I stumbled off back into the woods and I am thinking like, fine, fine, I'll quit tomorrow. And I'm making all the plans or everything we're gonna do as soon as I can get off trail. But by the end of that day, the medicine had kicked in and I could hold in a little food and a little water and not much had changed. And I'm still like stumbling down the trail going barely over a mile per hour. The record is way out of reach, long gone. But when I feel the slightest bit better, it's not suddenly a foregone conclusion that I have to quit. So then this question comes up and it's like, well, am I out here for a record? And I thought I was, I told people I was, I took the negativity for trying for it. I mean, that's the culture we live in, right? If you're not first, you're last. I wanted to be number one. And now that wasn't possible. So this bigger question came up and it's like, why am I out here? What is this really about? And what I recognized is that for me, it wasn't the most important thing for me to be the best, but it was deeply personal and important for me to find my best. And I felt like as long as I could keep going, if I could put one foot in front of the other, then I didn't have my answer. I hadn't found it yet. So the next day I kept going, but I let go of this idea of the record. I stopped obsessing over it. And when that happened, I realized how oppressive the record had been. Because up until that point for 12 days, every single day I felt like I was failing. Every single day I felt like I wasn't good enough. And every single day I was just focused on the numbers, the miles per hour, the miles per day, where I was not, where I needed to be. I was thinking about comparisons Right? Like, where were the other record setters? Where would they have been at any given point? And then I let go of the numbers and I let go of the comparisons. And instead of waking up each morning with these overwhelming expectations, I started to wake up and ask myself one question How far can I go today? That was it. How far can I go today? And when that a psychological shift took place, what do you think happened to my miles? It went up. What do you think happened to my enjoyment? Yeah. Up until that point, it just every moment felt like I was racing someone else and losing. And from that point forward, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm on the trail that I love, doing what I love with the person who I love helping me. And is it still hard? Yes. By the way, <laughs> what do you think happened to my shin splints? Did they go away? No, no they lasted till Virginia. They lasted over 1,000 miles. But I think when you're choosing the challenge and you know why you're there, you're able to manage the obstacles better. And also ibuprofen helps a lot, right? So 46 days after I started, I got to the end. My husband and I climbed that last mountain. We touched the sign at the end. I look at him ugly crying because I don't know what I'm feeling. I'm feeling all the emotions at once. So I look at him ah, with all the love in my heart. And he looks at me and he goes, we are never, never doing that again. I mean it this time, never again. And this time I knew 
walking down, I knew there would never be a need or desire for me personally to try to hike a trail again in that way. This is what it was supposed to feel like to give everything you had. Like I was on empty and it felt so good. And I was very ready for a different pace of life and a different adventure. But I look back on those experiences and I'm so grateful for them because what I have learned is that every time in my life, in work, as a mother, as a, as a spouse, no matter what it is, like there are moments when you feel lost and that's okay, it's natural. There are times where you need to remind yourself not to hide and to use your voice and to be kind by being honest. There are times where I just need to step back and because the world feels too much or there's too much stress or all these things going on, I just go outside and look around and remind myself that I am a part of nature and I'm telling you it still feels so good and so grounding. More than anything, I like to tell these stories, I think, to high schoolers, because man, high school is hard. I've done a lot of hard things. I think junior year of my life, junior year of high school was maybe the hardest of my life. I got about as much sleep junior year as I did on the trail record, okay? But that is the closest parallel that I, I have to feeling like every day was never good enough, and that I was summed up by numbers in comparisons. And I realized somewhere along the way, like, you are more than a resume, you are more than a number, you are more than an application. And if those things are motivating and driving for you, great. And if they're demoralizing for you, then you gotta wake up and you gotta let it go and you gotta ask yourself, what is the best I can do today? Because it's gonna make you enjoy, make you or allow you to enjoy being here a lot more. And then when you get to the end, here's the other thing I want to leave you with. When I got to the end of the Appalachian Trail, you know, it's funny because I started and again, there was all this doubt and criticism, negativity. I got to the end and we were successful and there was a lot of attention and there were a lot of questions. And the number one question people asked, besides wanting to know like how many pairs of shoes I went through, everyone wanted to know, five. I don't know why everyone wanted to know that. But the other question that everyone asked was, what's next? And it drove me crazy. Because the implication was like, well, are you going to go set a record on the Pacific Crest Trail? Are you going to go set a record on a different long trail? Like, what's next? What's bigger? What's better? And I was like, nothing. Not right now. I mean, maybe eventually, like, something, something different, yes. but like. We live in a what's next society and what's next mentality. And there's times to just enjoy the view, even on a record attempt, and enjoy being where you're at. And if I can offer like this one thing that I wish I had done differently looking back in high school, I was so focused on what's next. I wish I had just enjoyed where I was a little bit more. This is a beautiful place. You can see nature. Maybe you feel like a part of it. I'm sure there's days where you will feel lost, but I hope that no matter what, you can enjoy being here. Thank you. I think I have you for like three or four more minutes, so one or two questions. What do you want to know before you head out to class? Yes? You said you went to boarding school. Where did you get at? I went to the Asheville School in Western North Carolina. Yep. So my dad was like, this is so cool. This is the greatest thing ever. He dropped me off in um, Georgia. He told me he would pick me up from the trail, but only if I made it all the way to Maine. So he was all in. My mother told me it was the worst idea I'd ever had, and I was doing it to spite her and uh, a lot of other things. So very opposite reactions. My parents are together. They're still married. Um, I, had, I had graduated from college and I had saved up and I um, was fortunate to have a college um, sports scholarship. So I was financially independent. I was cut off from my parents and I felt like that gave me the freedom to do it. Um, and my parents, even though it was opposite reactions, it kind of landed somewhere in the middle for me of like, okay, there are things that are scary about this. I do need to be accountable to my family, my community, people who love me, but also I have some support and encouragement and feel like this is important for me to do. So very mixed, but that's kind of how I worked my way through it. Yeah. I 
I mean, there were like the, the moments of like, oh my gosh, I'm lost, like in the Smokies. That happened more than once in different ways. Or like, oh, I just twisted my ankle really, really poorly or really badly. And like, can I keep going? Like those moments, they happened. And again, for me, it was realizing, oh, it's not when or if you get sick or hurt or injured or lost. It's just learning how to manage that and navigate it when you do. One of the funniest places in Virginia was like, <laughs> I was very close to here and I was hiking by myself and I was snacking because you're always eating. And I like choked on a neon sour gummy worm. And I was like, this is it. I'm gonna like choke and asphyxiate and this is how I go on the trail because of a gummy worm. Um, and maybe that was actually the most serious incident on that, on that hike. But um, yeah, it, it just changed my mentality from instead of being like, oh no, what if, to saying like, okay, hard things are gonna happen. How do I manage it when they do? What's the coolest animal you've ever seen? The coolest animal? Um, it, it wasn't, I wouldn't say this is cool. I got growled at by a mountain lion. I was super intense. And in Australia, I was, um, they have emus, so like four or five foot tall birds. And I had one charge me, like run straight at me. And that really stands out for me as an animal encounter, partly because when I was young, my reoccurring nightmare was a big bird, right? So now it's like real life. I'm like, ah! And anyways, it didn't, it charged. Animals will sometimes do a false charge, run at you and veer off, and that's what happened. Um, but that stands out. And then some weird ones, like I saw a peacock on the Appalachian Trail. Like, you know, there are some weird animal encounters, but I love seeing animals in their natural habitat, and that's definitely one of the highlights for me of being outdoors. Yeah? What sport did you play in college? So I played tennis and basketball growing up, and I was sort of at the place where I could have played either at a small D1 school, but I played, I played tennis, yeah. Yes, okay, I know, okay, this is more than one or two. But last question, right, is that, okay, last question. What's the worst injury you got? The worst, really hiking, it's not a high risk sport. I'm not a thrill taker. People are like, whoa, adventure of the year and hiker and outdoors. And I can be by myself in the woods and feel pretty safe, but I'm not someone who like goes fast or goes hard, like I'm just walking. So not really, like sometimes there's cliffs, weather is definitely like something to respect, but the most common injuries hikers get are just overuse injuries. So plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, shin splints, that type of stuff. I did hit my head on a branch one time and I had to get five staples in my head because I was bleeding really badly. And running the hiking company for 15 years, we got like 12, 13,000 people outdoors and still very low risk of injury. Um, sprained ankles, we had one broken dislocated ankle, we had one copperhead bite in 15 years, but we had like five dog bites, you know? So it's, again, not, not what you would think going outdoors, it's relatively low risk, and if we're willing to get in our cars and drive 65 miles down an interstate with people we don't know, then I think, you know, we should be able to go out into the woods and walk two miles per hour without too much fear. So anyways, on that note, Y'all have a good day, a good weekend. Thank you for letting me come visit. I appreciate it.